Welcome back to Comic Book Historians. I'm Alex Grand. Go ahead and click on that juicy red subscribe button down below. Now, today we have a very special structured interview with Jerry Ordway. This one was orchestrated by my friend Filippo Marzo over at Comics Reporter. He basically asked me to co-interview Jerry Ordway with him, which of course I said yes. So we came up with six questions to fit within the limited amount of time that we had. Filippo has the Italian version of this interview on his site, and this one is the English version. So cheers, and let's welcome Jerry Ordway. Thank you. After you started getting into official DC comics around 1980, the, the environment of DC as the 80s progressed, you know, from, let's say, co-creating uh, Infinity Inc. with Roy Thomas in 1983 and the environment of DC Comics and you yourself as an artist as that decade progressed with inking Perez on Crisis on Infinite Earths, eventually penciling Adventures of Superman with Marv Wolfman and then actually becoming a writer artist uh, on Superman after that. Can you tell us about like your overall development, the environment of DC as it changed and you going from artist to uh, a more of a writer artist uh, and then working with guys like Roy Thomas and Marv Wolfman. Well, I think um, when I started, it was, I started in the summer of 1980 and DC was looking to get new talent. Um, they were definitely on a talent search, trying to find, you know, whatever the next, I don't know if it's the next hot artist or whatever. Um, but I was chosen among a couple other people that summer. I think Mark Silvestri and Larry Malstadt, who wound up inking Legion of Superheroes, were also chosen for the uh, from that talent search. And uh, so it was very exciting for me because I, I was new and it felt like everything, you know, each project I would do was going to be a step up. You know, I had the enthusiasm of youth. Um, working with Roy was my first full time job. And I, I, uh, I quit my, I had an art job that I worked uh, in an art studio full time. And I quit that to go freelance in uh, 1981 on All-Star Squadron because Roy, Roy was like my favorite Marvel writer. He had done the Avengers. The Avengers was really my favorite Marvel book. Just the, uh, you know, that period of, of the Avengers that really kind of is used in the movies and stuff. The, 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 re, the beginning of the vision and the, uh, you know, just all the conflicts between the characters. So it was really kind of a, a an amazing thing to, for that to be my first series. While I was on that, he and I, you know, co-created characters within Infinity Inc. and we kind of revamped things. And uh, I'd always wanted to, I, I'm not somebody who would, like, I didn't want to be uh, just an anchor or just anything. So I, you know, I came from an environment of doing my own comics not professionally, but I always wrote my own stuff and I always, you know, did the full art on it. So I, I felt like that was always kind of a goal. I just uh, think it was something that took a while to get to, to make it happen. I mean, it, it was kind of hard during the 80s until Frank Miller and John Byrne and, and Walter Simonson started writing and drawing and Howard Chaikin was another and Jim Starlin. They, uh, they were kind of like the guys who blazed that trail to uh, kind of turn that tide to allow artists to, to actually write stories or even to co-plot or plot stories. So uh, it, was, it was kind of a journey. So Infinity Inc. became kind of a, a, you know, the first, we were like one of DC's first direct sales comics as opposed to being on the newsstand. And the direct sales market is what we now have here as far as, you know, comic book stores, like a network of comic book stores. But uh, that was very new back in 1980. I think that was in 82 that we started talking about it, maybe 83. And uh, the idea of co-creating something meant that we would officially own a small piece of it, which is, uh, is kind of nice. And I think that, you know, was, it appealed to me because it felt like that was a step forward for the comic industry, you know, to have, especially in America, to have artists who had been and people who had been kind of cheated out of credit or money for creations. It felt like a, a very positive thing. And that the whole 80s, that whole arc of the 80s through to, to 89 and 90 um, was all about DC for me and increasing uh, creators stake in, in the comics. We got royalties for the first time in, in 1981. 
We had uh, um, creator, again, this creator share where you get equity in a character if it was used in a, as a toy or if it was used in TV movies or whatever. Um, so all these felt like very positive creative creator type um, directions. And uh, my journey through it was that when I worked on Crisis, uh, DC had a definite need because Dick Giordano was the anchor finisher on the book, but he was also like the editor in chief. And he realized like after a couple of issues that he just could not ink George Perez on a 20, you know, 27 page comic book every month and still work a full-time job. It just wasn't, uh, it wasn't feasible. So they, they were, they sought me out as one of George's, you know, top picks. So George kind of must have, targeted me somehow and uh when i got that job there was also a, a kind of a soft promise to be involved in the superman reboot or relaunch which was going to spin out a crisis and it didn't happen right away but uh i was at least given like a, an assurance that i would be part of that uh you know relaunch and uh, and i was it just took them a couple of years after crisis finished it, it was in 87 that i started working on uh, adventures of superman and uh trying to pitch plots and that was more successful after Marv Wolfman's first year when he was he was there for a year he established a, a good tone I think for for our book and then uh, John Byrne took over as the the script uh, plotter and he allowed me to co-plot so that was another step forward for me so I felt like I'd always in, I'd always contributed to stories but artists contribute to stories and ultimately, it really doesn't get credited unless you get credited as a co-plotter in, in the, the official credits. So I would throw in things into stories from the time I started penciling. I would throw uh, little bits into, into the backgrounds or, in, or actually plot ideas. But uh, until uh, Byrne took over on the Adventures of Superman, I, I, didn't, I hadn't gotten credited for it. So I think getting a co-plotter credit, it's basically them building my confidence. Um, that's what to me feels like it, it led more organically to becoming a writer artist because when John Byrne left uh, I Mike Carlin asked me who what writers would you like to work with and I gave him a, a short list of people that I thought would be fun to work with that I could collaborate with and then he just called me back and he said why don't you do it yourself and I was like uh really <laughs> sure <laughs> So he, he, he helped me uh, with the transition as well because he, you know, he knows the uh, a comic book page has specific needs that you don't really think about unless you have to do it. But how much copy will fit on a page? How much will a reader want to read? You know, I mean, uh, I think he, he found as an editor that he made the comment to me after my first story. He said, why are all you artists so talky? You know, because I had I had too much dialogue and too much uh, dial uh, captions and you know too many word balloons in my story. So he he taught me how to cut it back uh, so that it the art could breathe a little bit and it wasn't overwhelmed by one or the other. And and that was you know that was a valuable lesson for me. That was uh, kind of an unofficial uh, schooling, you know. And a, a lot of probably a, a lot of other editors may not have known enough to to actually give me that, you know, the information that I used from that point on. Um, but that, yeah, it became very, it was an organic kind of, kind of, uh, yeah, I felt like I had a trajectory <laughs> that was going up. And as, as the projects got higher profile, I was definitely given more to do and I was given better projects. Clearly with Superman, that was a big project. And then uh, you know, shortly after that, I was, I did the Batman movie comic adaptation was, was a very uh, uh, high profile thing too. And this is perfect where you left off because that goes into the next question. Tell us about working on that first Batman uh, film adaptation because Danny O'Neill scripted it and you were the artist on it. And did you get film clips to reference material? How were those discussions with Danny as far as construction of that graphic novel? <clears throat> well, the my I think my involvement with the uh, Batman movie comic adaptation really started with uh, I had gone to a comic a comic book show in the UK in London, 
uh, called UCAC. It was in 1988 in October. And at that time, Batman was in production. It hadn't started filming, but they were built, they were building sets in um, at Pinewood Studios and just outside of London. So I was able to get a tour along with, I mean, other artists and, and creators who were there, DC was able to get them into like a little informal tour of the studio and the, to tour the sets. And I missed that initial one because I didn't arrive into the UK until the day, I mean, late at the end of the day, they'd already done that. So I, after the convention was over, I had, my girlfriend and I were staying for another week and uh, Jeanette Kahn got us to, you know, a little, uh, not passes, but she got us, you know, the uh, access to the, just wandering around the sets. And we got to meet people and we got to meet all the production people, got to see the costume up close, um, got to see the car up close and hear from the people who designed it. It was very exciting. So I go back to the States, my friends, everybody's talking about Batman. Oh, is it gonna be good? Is it gonna be bad? Everybody thought Keaton, you know, what, with people that I knew, everybody liked the casting, but Nicholson as the Joker was clearly the big draw. And um, so a friend of mine was an editor. He was handed the editing of all the comic book movie adaptations. And he and I always used to hang out and, and we started talking about how a lot of times these things are done with talent that is not busy in all other books. And it's not always that they seek out like the you know, the best person for the job, it's kind of like who's available, who's who's not busy right now, and that's who they would get to do the movie stuff. Marvel had uh, some really great movie adaptations in the 70s and the 80s, uh, including uh, Al Williamson doing Star Wars, which was, you know, terrific. So we wanted to put that same energy into, into it, so I agreed to do it, and uh, Jonathan, I told him I would, I would do it as long as he did it, as much as he could to get me reference. And uh, he, he was really good about it. And Warner Brothers was really good about it. I, I, um, I got most of my reference up front, which was a series of film boxes with eight by 10 set stills. Um, because again, by the time I started, it was February and they were filming in February. They were, I think they finished filming by maybe March or the end of February, early March. And uh, Denny started, Denny O'Neill worked on the adaptation, adaptation of the movie script. And uh, he was working from the shooting script that existed when they started production. But the movie started immediately improvising. There were scenes that came out of nowhere, some scenes that were dropped. So Denny did a couple of edits. Um, but at a certain point, Jonathan Peterson asked Denny, who is also a full-time editor, do you want to keep re-editing this stuff or will you just trust us to do it because we wanted to make it the comic book look like the movie we didn't want to have you know too many scenes like oh this wasn't in the movie but it was in a sh you know so anyways uh, from that point on Denny was he said go for it so Jonathan and I would confab we would just get on the phone and we would talk practically every day and he would get some stills from the film or he would get like what they call a contact sheet and they were not really great reference, but they would be basically a film strip that somebody had made a photocopy of. So not picture quality, like a, you know, like a photograph of, of actual print. It was a photocopy off of an, off of a film. And we would look at these things. He'd make, you know, he, he and I would talk over, well, what scene is this replacing? So we were trying to, trying to figure out where it would fit and what maybe got cut from the shooting script. So we were piecing it together and making a lot of guesses. And uh, the whole goal was that by the end of this thing, when there was less reference, because it was all happening on set kind of in a, in a um, improvisational way, um, we wanted to still make sure that the movie ended where the comic would end so that it would be a, a good experience for a, com a kid re reading the comic, that it would, it would reflect the movie. Uh, but there were a lot of things we guessed at, and um, we wound up going to, uh, it wasn't an exclusive Hollywood premiere, but it was a screening that was done for, I think, local comic book fan and DC, you know, DC employees in, uh, I think it was the end of May, 
that we saw this film and he and I sat next to each other and every time we guessed right, we would just high five each other <laughs> in the audience um, because we felt like, you know, we, we actually guessed correctly the comic was gonna match what the movie was. Cause we had to finish the comic by, uh, I think it was, our deadline was to finish the comic at some point in the first week of April because there was a, long, a longer production time in those days. And uh, we didn't want to give, we didn't want to shortchange Steve Olaf, who was doing the colors. And Steve Olaf actually did this, was one of the first uh, computer colored, it wasn't the first, but it was one of the first mainstream type DC project that was computer uh, colored. So uh, we, we had to leave extra time for production. And then again, the book, you know, printed and shipped on time. And uh, it, it actually was, it was just amazing that we, you know, that we actually guessed so many things right based on, you know, little, little, small little pictures that you'd have to look at with a, a magnifying glass to figure out a background or whatever, but, uh, but it was fun. And it was, a, it was an exhausting process, but it was very gratifying to see the movie and find that we, you know, I think we, we did, we did it justice, you know, from the look of the film, from the, the actors, uh, likenesses and all those things it was very uh, it was gratifying to kind of feel like we succeeded and it sold really well which was you know that was like uh, the icing on the cake as they say can you share with us memories of working and co-creating the wild star character with al gordon for image comics how was that process and did you find that your experience as a writer and artist brought something positive to that character when Image first launched, I knew most of the guys that had started Image because some of them, I, I, I knew Rob Liefeld when he was a teenager. I knew Eric Larson when he first got into comics. Um, and I was excited by the idea of Image. I know a lot of people with, even within comics, there were, there were a lot of people who were kind of negative about it, but I always felt like the companies held all the, all the cards, the companies were in control. And anybody who did a creator owned project in the seventies, Marvel was doing Epic and uh, there were other smaller publishers in the US like Eclipse Comics and then Pacific Comics that were doing, and First Comics were doing kind of creator owned things, but they didn't have the same, uh, they didn't have the sale, the sales capacity or the potential as, as much. To me, it felt like the Marvel and DC kind of had a stranglehold on the industry. So when Image came about, I was excited for these guys, but I also felt like they were smart in that they took characters that they were known for and they didn't change them too much to make them their own, you know? So Todd McFarlane did, was, had made his name on Spider-Man and Spawn was not quite Spider-Man. He was a little bit like, you know, Doctor Strange and Batman combined or whatever. But the other guys all kind of did stuff that their their core audience would definitely buy. They did they they didn't try to be experimental. So I like that. And Al and I, Al Gordon and I, had known each other for years. And uh, Al had uh, said, you know, we could do one for them. And I was like, that would be kind of fun, because I had thought maybe I could do my proton character, or you know, I had characters from my childhood, and uh, the idea of collaborating seemed more fun. Uh, because then it also becomes kind of a, you got somebody to bounce ideas off of, you know, it's not just you working all by yourself and hoping for the best. So Al and I started talking and unfortunately, or fortunately or unfortunately, the death of Superman that I was involved in uh, was happening around that same time. So I had a lot of different things that I had to do. I was committed to DC to do Shazam I was working on a full color uh, relaunch of his or, the Captain or, original Captain Marvel's origin. I had been working on that as a side project while I was writing Superman. So I knew something had to give. And I felt like Wildstar, we had to do that while it, while it was hot at the moment. So I, in fairness, I talked to the DC people and I said, look, I'm going to do this image thing. And I think it'll probably help in the long run because I'm still going to do Shazam. But by the time I do Shazam, my profile will be much higher and it'll probably sell better because I'll be you know, more known. And I didn't realize at the time that the, that the Superman would actually do that on its own, that it would be a, 
a huge, huge hit. So, uh, but Al and I started working, we designed characters, we, we talked. I mean, Al is a guy who wants to talk all the time. And sometimes you can't get any work done if you're talking to somebody four hours a day. <laughs> but uh, we, we chatted back and forth, we would do sketches. And I think, as I recall, I was, we had faxes back then, which if anybody is young, they won't really know, but a fax machine was basically a way to send a picture through your phone line. You know, and so I had a fax machine and I would draw sketches of these various characters and we would send them back and forth. And Al would say, hey, how about this? Or here's a name for a character or whatever. And that's how we worked out the story. We worked it out uh, between the two of us. We hammered it out. And then um, we I started drawing it and he uh, inked it and he and he did the, the scripting on it. So it was a it was a true collaboration. Um and it was fun, but I only ever thought of it as we're going to, I'm going to do, you know, four or five issues and the story is going to be done for me. Um, Cause if you read it, you, I, my favorite time travel stories in a lot of ways are loops. I like the idea of a time travel loop. So Wildstar kind of starts in a place and it changes, but it does kind of almost loop back to the beginning. And that felt very complete for me. So when anybody ever asked why didn't I do any more Wildstar, it was really just that I wanted that one experience and uh, I really wasn't ever thinking of it as a long-term project. It felt to me, it felt like I was doing a novel. The story's done, you know, um, but it was fun. And it was, it was the technically the first image book outside of the core the core owners of the, you know, the, the, the four, um, not four, but the seven, I guess it was seven guys. Um, we were like the first to get green lit. I don't know if we were the first one to come out in that, but, um, we actually came out, our first two issues were solicited by Malibu comics and then image took over and published themselves after that point. Um, but it was fun. It was gratifying. It was really cool to be part of that but it was weird to have that happen at the same time the death of Superman did because both projects and both things had the potential to make us like the Beatles. You know what I mean? It was, they were, they were successful beyond anybody's wildest imagination. You just could never have said, this is going to be this successful. And that happened, you know, twice within that same time frame. you know, with, uh, with Superman and, and Wildstar. Um, but that's, you know, again, it was fun to do that. And it's something that we, uh, I think fans still refer to it. They still ask me about it. People still ask me to sign copies of it, which is kind of fun, you know. Captain Marvel and the power of Shazam. Uh, you were writer and painter. And I think many fans would agree that you pulled it off. It's a beloved uh, work that you've done. Tell us about putting that together, but also why is it difficult for a lot of modern creators to capture uh, that character in a way that resonates with fans the way it did in the Golden Age comics? So if I start out with how I got Shazam, I, Shazam actually has a, a direct line to the, the Batman movie comic because again, being friends with the editor of that, Jonathan Peterson was the editor of the Batman movie book. He and I, again, we would get together socially. We would, we would hang out, we'd go see movies, we'd talk about comics, comics that we liked, we talked about movies we liked. And he had inherited a Shazam project uh, as an editor at DC, they just said, hey, you can, you're, you're, you're doing Shazam. So he called up John Byrne and John Byrne was gonna do Shazam. And John had done, um, uh, I guess he'd written or given an overview of his storyline. He'd drawn a couple pages and then John quit over, and it was DC politics thing. He was pretty justified in my estimation. So Jonathan Peterson calls me up in a panic. He goes, look, I need to, I still need to do this. And uh, it, you know, if, if I can't, if I can't get a good creator on this project to do it, DC's maybe going to choose somebody else to, do, to edit it or whatever. So he and I went back to the source, not the comic source, as much as we went to the Republic Pictures serial. And we used to watch the serial. He had loaned me, he had it on Laserdisc. And I'd seen it before, um, but uh, watching it on Laserdisc, and we actually sat together and watched it. 
and I sat with a notebook and I made notes and that was kind of uh, what excited me about it was the idea that you could add in elements from the comic that actually never were done in a chronological way. Like the comic book introduced Black Adam in the later 40s and he was a big villain, but he really is only in one major storyline. Yet when you look at his historical biography in the DC, um, in their, their literature, their who's who, his, his character ties back to Shazam, to the wizard. So I told Jonathan, if we build this story from the ground up, we build it as a parallel story, Black Adam and Captain Marvel. And we tie in his father, Billy Batson's parents hadn't really been seen before in the comics. Uh, he was just thrown at the reader as an orphan who follows a stranger into a subway. So I had said, let's do this as a kind of a tribute to the serials, but it's also a tribute to our love of the Indiana Jones movies. And the Indiana Jones movies have this great, uh, rich, very warm color palette. You know, mainly the, the first movie is desert stuff. And even the second one, there's a rich, a lot of browns and ochres and, and uh, sepia colors and stuff. It just gives it a nostalgic feel without feeling cheesy. So uh, um, I started researching Egyptology. I, tr I, I tried to fit in without going totally crazy because it's still a, cre a fantastic creation or whatever. I tried to fit in things into timelines that worked and uh, built the story out from there. But the main thing, which may be a spoiler, but not 30 years later, <laughs> is that uh, I said, the one problem I always had reading Billy ba uh, about Billy Batson is that he follows a stranger into a subway. And I said, you know, when I was a kid, you're not supposed to go with strangers, <laughs> you know? you don't. So I, I, I came up with the idea that the stranger was actually the spirit of his father. And that's why he follows him. He follows him because he, he trusts him. The idea of Billy uh, following his father into the subway kind of solves a problem for me that just felt like nobody had asked before. You know, maybe nobody cared, but uh, um, yeah, the, the graphic novel itself, I, I kind of had to fight to, uh, to do it the way I did it because um, comic books at that time weren't really geared towards drawing full color work on, on the actual boards. They had different process for, uh, for how they would do that. It, was, it involved like a print process where you would do a line art page, you would draw your comic in a normal way and then they would create a, an overlay with the line art and a board that was blue lined that you would then hand color, almost like an animation cell. And I really didn't want to work that way. So I made it a stipulation of, of doing the project that I could do full color art. Um, and then they would deal with how they could make you know, how they could get it reproduced correctly. Because again, it was tricky. They just weren't geared towards doing, uh, photographing a painting basically, even though it's still got line art in it. It was, it was kind of like a watercolor um, with uh, Prismacolor, you know, colored pencils and, and a lot of mixed media, which nowadays you can scan it. You know, I mean, it's, it's fairly simple. I could scan it and upload the file to the company. Back in those days, they had to figure out ways to uh, reproduce that with the printing presses that they were using and, and the color process and everything else. So they actually had to do a lot of production work to make it, to make it look as good as it did. I mean, the art, to transfer the art to the printed page, they had to do a little extra work to kind of make sure that the blacks, the line art or the black shadows stayed black. Um, uh, so the, the guy who worked on that in, in DC's production, was his name was Dale Crane. And Dale went above and beyond his normal job to make sure he proved everything, made sure all the, the, uh, the, the, the pages as painted looked vivid, which was another big thing that we wanted. But, uh, but ultimately it was very, again, very, uh, I think it was a successful project. They printed it, I want to say, 18, was it 18 or 20,000 copies in hardcover is the initial printing. And, uh, and then it went to uh, softcover, I think six months later. 
and the soft cover kept getting reprinted. I mean, I, by the I think it went out of print somewhere around 2008 or nine, and it had been up to about 10 printings by that time. It sold steadily over that long period. It still sold 500 copies a year, which was good for a backlist. You know, something that they didn't they didn't have to do anything new new to. Um, uh, and it, it, it effectively, it, it became Billy Batson's origin, um, which was also good. So it kind of, I think it had a longer life in a sense, past even the, our comic version of it, the monthly book. Um, but the, uh, the monthly book was also something that they talked to me about when I was doing the graphic now, doing the, the standalone story. And I knew that I didn't want to draw it and write it because I had um, my wife and I had just started our family. Our kids were real, you know, were little, little, and I wanted to be available and, and not be on deadline all the time. So I, I agreed to write it. And I wanted to, again, to paint the cover so that it would have that feel of the, the graphic novel. And most things that are, they wind up being gratifying because they were kind of fight, you know, they're a fight. I had to fight to get it a painted cover on a comic because the standard response was we don't do painted covers on monthly comics. Um, yet they, you know, they would break that rule themselves on occasion. So uh, um, the series was successful. And then suddenly I think DC felt that it ran out of steam or something. And uh, I still had ideas. I, I really desperately wanted to get to issue 50 because issue 50 had a, a, a significance to me as a child first Spider-Man comic that I bought as a 10 year old was issue 50. And I remember finding issue 50, Spider-Man, Peter Parker's walking away from his costume in a garbage can in a foreground. But I remember thinking, I'd never heard of Spider-Man before, but wow, it's up to issue 50, that must be successful. So in my head, you know, 50 issue run would be a success. So that was my goal with Shazam and we almost made it. <laughs> Sadly, not quite. You co-created Zero Hour uh, with Dan Jurgens, and really interesting um, series. And it brought a lot of the 90s uh, style, that early 90s style, to an interesting climax with the DC Universe. Tell us about co-creating that with Dan Jurgens, And also, since you're both writer-artists, did that in any way create any stepping on each other's feet? Or was it more of a synergy that you spoke the same language? Well, um, the, it's actually funny. And on Zero Hour, I would I could only say that Dan and I co-created the art. I mean, he did the heavy lifting. He that was his idea, his storyline. I, I didn't have anything to do with the storyline except for working off of layouts that he did. Um, I've known Dan, I think since 1981 is the first time I met him at Chicago Comic Convention, and he's a Minnesota guy. I was Wisconsin, so we we're Midwest sensibility, kind of the. Uh, the aw shucks guys, you know, probably we're both attuned to what Clark Kent seems like he should be about. <laughs> but um, he he actually he, he and I have been friends for so long. And uh, Dan actually hit the writer artist thing before I did um, early on when he was doing uh, Sun Devils with uh, Jerry Conway. And then I think Conway, Jerry Conway backed off on writing it and just let Dan write it. Um, so I, I've always been, I think, not, I, I've never felt really competitive with Dan because I feel like, you know, we're both kind of on a similar wavelength or whatever. Um, but yeah, he, uh, when he offered me the idea of, of ink and zero hour or doing finishes on it, uh, because my, I was, I had just finished the Shazam, the, the power Shazam graphic novel and, um, I was not really looking to get into anything heavy duty. And I knew that the regular series wouldn't start right away anyways. Um, but originally we were supposed to launch Power Shazam. Issue one was gonna launch in, in the zero hour, in the zero issue wave. So there would have been, the first one would have been an issue zero uh, with artist Mike Waringo, who was, would have been great, but Mike dropped out late, very late into it. so. I, it didn't happen. But anyways, Dan had asked me if I would do finishes on this thing. And he figured it would be a light enough workload for me that I wasn't worrying about writing anything. I would just, I could still 
change my kids diapers and get up with them in the middle of the night and <laughs> all that stuff and uh, it was a fun project to work on in that way um and dan's work is fun uh he and i had worked together plenty of times we did covers together we worked on superman obviously but kind of together sometimes separate or mostly separately sometimes together um and i always like dan's layouts and and when you're drawing comics i always hit a point where you know you're usually working on your own thing and you get sick of what you're doing and it, it happens so i mean it's some people just get bored i don't get bored i just get sick of my own layouts or whatever so for me it, it used to be a way to recharge would be to ink someone else's work for a period of time or for a month or a couple months it was just a good way to um to kind of recharge my batteries to see how somebody else handles the storytelling mechanics you know how do you solve problems and things like that so uh that's my you know how my association with that came about and um uh i was thinking about like with storytelling not to extend this too much longer but um in the after shazam i wanted i i got uh i did some tom strong stuff with alan moore when he was still it was wild storm i guess and then dc and uh that was one of those things that kind of always was a dream of mine because I really loved Alan Moore's work. And Alan was one of the guys who was mentioned as a possible writer when I was, I knew I was going to do Adventures of Superman, but I didn't know who I was going to do it with. And uh, I, at one point, the editor said, yeah, Alan Moore's you know, going to write it and you're going to draw it. And I was like, wow, that would be really amazing because I was a big fan from his, uh, his British stuff. He did Warrior Magazine. He did more, uh, Miracle Man was Marvel Man. Um, I just was a huge fan. So it took me, you know, several years after that to work with him on Tom Strong, which was uh, was fun. It was like very hard work, but very fun because he just uh, was amazing, you know, as far as his ideas and, and his, his view. I mean, he can look at a comic page and see right into the far background. <laughs> He's there's not a lot of uh, improvisation with working with him. Everything's described. Um, and Jeff Johns is a little like that. I mean, Jeff, Jeff is, is also a really good writer. Who's also got a visual, you know, a visual style, but uh, anyways, you know, co-creating that just imagine uh, justice league with Stan Lee. How did that project get started and tell us about these plotting sessions with Stan and then how did that work as far as plotting and writing in dialogue? How was that process going there? I got, again, I had a, a long association with Mike Carlin and Mike Carlin was the editor, technically the editor of that 12 issue series. And the, the only backstory that I know about it is that during that specific year, Stan Lee was dropped from Marvel as editor emeritus, which basically gave him a chunk of money. I mean, he, he had like a deal that I guess Marvel paid him a million dollars a year to be their spokesperson. And when they went through bankruptcy, they found ways to get rid of things, they cut him from that. And Mike Carlin immediately contacted Stan and he said, do a 12 issue thing for us and you'll cover your whatever you lost there you know you write 12 issues of this uh stanley creates the dc universe so then mike set out trying to put what he felt were the best and most appropriate teams as collaborators you know joe kubert did the the uh, batman one uh john buscema did the superman one he had adam hughes he had walt simonson he had dave gibbons he had i mean it was a, a really pretty uh nice group of of people i think kevin mcguire myself um my story was going to take place i think i think it was the fourth one I, I don't know it was maybe fourth or fifth one to come out because it the other characters had to be established first and i was given copies photocopies of everybody's work and tried to figure out what the characters are about and then in preparation for that just do a little study up and then I had some ideas and I got on a conference call with Mike, uh, Stan, Michael Uslin, who was kind of also helping out in there. And Michael Uslin is the producer of the Batman movies and former DC writer himself. 
Uh, so this four of us on the phone start throwing around ideas for what is the Justice League, you know, as, as created by Stan Lee. And we had a couple of, I think we had one major conversation. And uh, at the end of it, Stan ends it. He says, well, I think we've got everything we need. And he said, Jerry, you don't need me to type up a plot. You've got everything right there. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> as I wasn't taking any notes. <laughs> And then Mike, Mike uh, Carlin, uh, he, he chimed in and he said, oh, he said, you'll be good because we've, we've been taking notes all along. So we got all the, you know, so we got the notes. So it, it was good. So I, I had the notes, they just typed up, you know, Mike had the notes typed up in, a, in order of how we described the story. And then I started drawing it and uh, I did it in layout, more layout form so that Stan could have some say in if he didn't like one thing or whatever it wasn't going to you know be like having to redraw the whole thing but i laid out the book and then i put notes pretty much just like jack kirby and steve ditko did when they worked with them put little notes outside the panel saying here's what this refers to stan got that he went through the whole thing he typed up his dialogue he made a few changes which were minor and uh and then i got the pages back with with his letter with the lettering on it and I finished the pages and, and uh, that was it. It was super smooth, you know, very smooth process. Um, and uh, it, it, again, it was a great project. I had worked, I, I had met Stan a couple of times in, uh, in the eighties when I would do the San Diego Comic Con. At one point he had uh, asked me about working on a, he was doing a Excelsior project for Marvel. Like in, uh, it had to be, maybe early nineties. And um, he and I talked about that at the convention. So I knew him, he knew me a little bit, but again, his memory was pretty bad, but, uh, but he was always very enthusiastic and, and he had that, uh, he really to the end, he had that kind of enthousi enthusiastic delivery and everything sounded fun. And, you know, he could tell you to go, to go paint, uh, paint his car to, to, you know, cut his grass, you know, his lawn or something. And you would do it because he just had that kind of energy to him. And, uh, and it was fun. Again, it was, it was, uh, it was kind of like this feeling of walking with giants, you know, um, I was lucky enough to work and to know Jack Kirby a little bit. And I worked with a, a ton of comic creators, even before my generation of, of uh, when I was reading stuff, I got to meet Jerry Robinson was a super nice person. I, I've been very blessed in that sense of being able to uh, work with creators, older creators that again, Wayne Boring was another one. I worked with a bunch of them when I worked with Roy Thomas. Um, uh, and then on Superman, I got to work with a bunch of people too. So there was, it was just another nice experience to work with Stan Lee in that sense of feeling like you were co-creating or, or, or something with him. What projects are you working on as far as current and future projects? Is there the possibility of any self-produced projects as well? Uh, what do you got going on these days? Uh, well, actually, I do have, um, I can even, I can even, I've been doing a, a self-published comic with a character that I created when I was a teenager. And uh, I've been doing them and selling them mostly at comic book shows locally in the, in the U.S., and selling some through a link on my Twitter feed as well. Um, and that's pretty much the comic stuff that I'm doing right now. I haven't been, I have like a, a thing that I'm pitching with uh, Roger Stern uh, to Marvel, but nothing's set right now. So I'm at this point, I'm just doing, I'm doing commissions and I'm keeping busy, but I kind of was trying to get some, uh, I guess getting, it's, it's hard to get going on your own project because it's, self-funded as well which is a little harder so you know you have to balance taking on some paid work to keep you know the bills paid and and all that and then still have momentum to do the book um that's the hard part Filippo is asking if you've had a um uh, any sort of relationship with italy as far as uh, visiting any sort of uh, professional relationship with it or personal relationship with anything of italian culture um, what, what would you have to say about that? Or Italian I, food, absolutely, pizza, gelato. 
<laughs> I love Italian food. <laughs> um, I actually, it's kind of funny when I was working on Shazam, which is, I guess, taking it back in the early days of the internet, let's put it this way. We used to be able to communicate through message boards. And in 1992, my daughter was born. So it was around 92. I was working, I was trying to maintain normal work hours of, you know, being in bed by 10 o'clock or something in, in the evening. But my daughter was a baby and she was going through, it was like when she was, when your baby is not able to sleep through the night, it takes a while. So this was the first six months of her life. So at one point, I know she was, she, I would get up with her and I got up at like four in the morning, my time, Eastern, you know, United States time. And I couldn't get back to sleep. She fell asleep in my studio, you know, in a little, a little cradle crib thing. And, uh, but I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't, I didn't want to wake her. So I was a wide awake at this point. So I went on to CompuSurf, which was an early uh, message board. It was an early way of connecting on the internet, basically with strangers. Um, and they had a comic book uh, board that a lot of other comic creators were on. So at four in the morning, I had a conversation with a, uh, an Italian fan. At, and uh, um, the name will pop in. I remember the first name was, was very distinctive and now I can't remember it, but we typed messages back and forth for about an hour. And I remember uh, it's one of those humbling things that uh, as a comic book person in the United States, it's always amazing to find that the work is, that my work is known, maybe I'm not a superstar, but my work is known in places that, you know, I can't even imagine, you know what I mean? Um, the power of something like Superman or Batman or Captain Marvel, these things have a reach well beyond my territory. And I'm always impressed by that because I think, um, I used to get, uh, um, DC used to supply us with all the, the, what we, we would get foreign reprints. So we would get like the editions that were done by, uh, were, I was apparently fairly popular in South America and Brazil and places like that because I had the kind of a realistic style. So they really loved John Buscema and I felt very flattered that they loved my Superman in the same way that they loved Kurt Swans, but they didn't like John Byrne, <laughs> you know, cause this work was too stylized or something. Um, but there's, there's Italian editions of my Superman comics that I've, I have. And uh, the Batman movie book had been translated in practically every language, including at the time, it was a first, they actually got a, they were, there's a Japanese edition and Japan was notorious for not importing work. They would, you know, generally create their own version of something rather than uh, bring it in. But because it was a big movie, uh, it expanded the reach. But uh, Shazam, I think I have Italian editions as well. So I know that the work has been reprinted in many, many places. And uh, I'm a big fan. I'll tell you though, I, I, I would be hard pressed to name names, but I know because my my brain is like Swiss cheese when I think about names, and I always forget them just as I'm, but uh, I know there's a, there's a lot of really fine Italian comic artists. And I, I've had, um, I couldn't tell you the names though. I, I know I've got editions of, uh, of work, but I always used to go to Forbidden Planet in New York City. I moved east to Connecticut in the eighties. And one of the first places that I visited with my exec, who was showing me around, he took me right to Forbidden Planet in the uh, in Manhattan, Lower Manhattan, and I just started buying, you know, the Judge Dredd, and I, I was buying um, a lot of the French uh, graphic novels. Again, that stuff inspired me to want to do Shazam the way I did because I have a bookcase full of all these really beautiful hand colored, you know, painted but not they're, they're watercolor paintings and pencil, you know, the same techniques that I tried for. Um, so I've always liked the idea of there's kind of a brotherhood of creative people. And if you like comics, comics feel very universal. You know, they're not, it's not just like, well, Superman's really not 
American, you know, like uh, specific. He's a character that belongs to the world. And in a way, Batman is a character. They become so huge and so recognizable that they, uh, they belong to more than just where they started. And the reach of, of my having worked on these things, I, I, I'm, again, it's just, it's kind of humbling to, I never even thought I would be able to successfully get into comics as a kid. And then, you know, I'm seeing it, my work being reprinted all across the world. It's very, it's weird at one, on one hand, but it's very gratifying. It's the type of thing where you could never have, uh, you know, when I was 13 years old, drawing my own little comics, I would never have thought that was even possible. So it's it's definitely uh, it's gratifying, and I like the idea of, of uh, other cultures because I think um, there's always something new to learn. You know, um, I find that uh, I while I work, I listen to audiobooks, and I've caught up on books that I always thought someday I will read this. I mean, like War and Peace or you know Crime and Punishment. Those were goals of mine, but I knew that I couldn't, I didn't have enough time to devote sitting in front of a, you know, a, a lamp or under a lamp and reading a book. So while I work, as long as I'm not writing, if I'm just drawing, I can listen to audiobooks and and still draw. So, uh, uh, but I, I've been reading a lot of uh, World War II history, World War I history, um, kind of the history starting in 1900 even and moving forward. And you get a sense of how things, you know, kind of repeat, patterns repeat, and uh, and types of problems repeat. But it's always interesting to read things that you go, wait, I never knew that because, you know, when, we're, when we go through school and we hear history or whatever it is, you don't really, you're getting kind of like the short version of everything, kind of a concise version that leaves out a lot of, a lot of detail and, uh, and I find like reading World War II or World War I history really fascinating because of how all the different players are involved and how devastated, I mean, like with Italy reading about the devastation of World War II, you know, we never had that here. So, I mean, that perspective is kind of, uh, I guess it's, it's you, you feel it more and you feel the, the horror of war much more when you realize that we've never really, I mean, we haven't fought any of these world wars on our in our backyard. They're always somewhere else, and the destruction is always somewhere else. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I, I I think about stuff like that. I like to be open to the culture. I just I've never been to Italy, but I don't really like flying. <laughs> I'm not a traveler. I went to to the UK that one time, and I always thought it would be fun to go back, but I just don't. You know, getting on an airplane doesn't appeal to me at all if i could teleport me like in star trek i would be there i would go anywhere because i always thought it would, it would have been fascinating to see uh the uh, egyptian sites you know when i was doing shazam and i was reading about about the uh the temple at abu simbel i mean that was really interesting and seeing pictures can't really they can't really prepare you for seeing something you know a 40 foot tall statue with the sun hitting, you know, something in a specific way or whatever. So I, I do, uh, I'm like an armchair uh, traveler. <laughs> I travel through video or through, uh, um, but yeah, like, so my, my long winded answer is no, I've never been to Italy, but I love, I love the idea of it. And I love the, I love your culture. And uh, um, I do know, I, I wish I could think of names of, of of, of artists. I, I have so many uh, collections of, of different artists and it usually is the art or the, there's some appeal within the art that grabs me. And um, so I don't even, like a lot of this stuff, I don't think of it specifically the country of origin in a lot of respects. I just think, wow, this is a different perspective. You know, it's really interesting. And you always, as an artist, you can always learn from seeing how somebody else approaches something. Um, Yep. Thank you so much, Jerry. I had a great time. I've Thank I've you. read a lot of your stuff and I love your illustration style. It's like you had some commercial art experience in the late seventies and you had this illustration stuff. You did some golden book stuff and I can kind of see that style kind of lingered because you have like an illustrative style with what you do. 
thank, thank you, you thank much. you thank you so much uh, jerry thank, thank you eh? thank you for the opportunity okay, okay thank you very much